Good morning. Kent Hovind here. Actually, afternoon. I've recorded this program twice. Sorry about this. Class number 10 on uh, what on earth is about to happen, for heaven's sake, based on my book that is soon to be available in very, very limited edition paperback. We're working on getting just a few printed for those who want to donate to help get the ministry kick-started running again. Uh, several people have said, how can we help? Well, the Bible says the lack of money is the root of all problems. Second Opinions, chapter 5, verse 3. I'm kidding, Hannah. Okay, that's not in the Bible. Anyway, uh, if you want to help, we're going to have a special uh, hardback fancy edition of my new book, a signed autographed copy, if that's worth anything. Uh, to some people, it makes it worth less, believe me. But uh, for those who want to give $500, we will, uh, to get the ministry jump-started and going again, we want to try to keep my son and the ministry totally separate from what we're doing because I seem to be radioactive for some reason. They're after me. I'm not paranoid. They really are after me. So we're going to finish here covering part, uh, in seminar part five, or I mean uh, appendix five of the book, in class number 10 here. And I'm hoping to get to your questions. I have many pages of questions, and I'm sorry. Thank you for your patience. We're getting there as quick as we can. So we've covered a lot of things so far. The, the 70th week of Daniel is part four of the book, and it's divided into five parts, four A, B, C, D, and E. And we talked about that already on this program. Seminar or part five of the book is the thousand year period, the thousand year millennial reign, as it's called. Jesus Christ came 2,000 years ago, and of course, the Vikings almost conquered the world uh, 1,000 years ago. I'm Norwegian. And then we have today. And starting soon, maybe in the next three or four or five years, we will see. I don't know, and I'm not setting a date. But we will see the time of the when Israel makes a treaty or somebody, the Antichrist, makes a treaty with Israel and allows them to rebuild their temple. And part four on this chart is only a sixteenth of an inch long. Which, so all of this is greatly expanded from that little sixteenth of an inch. There are five parts, three and a half years of temple being rebuilt and uh, real problems on planet Earth. Then the Antichrist will set up an image in the temple. He will desolate this brand new temple somehow. And the desolation, the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, uh, is going to take place in the middle of that week, that seven-year period. And then comes the time of great tribulation. After the tribulation, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, all say, after the tribulation, which I don't know how I could miss that for 40 years of my Christian life, but after the tribulation, the Lord comes back, angel blows a trumpet, catches up his believers. And I know there are those who say, well, that passage in Matthew 24 is only for the Jews. You are absolutely 100% wrong. That is for the believers. In my book, somebody wrote me a question while I was writing the book and said, hey, that passage is for the Jews. I, I wrote 64 times. It refers to the disciples, to you, thou shalt, 64 times in those three passages. So you're wrong. Don't go around telling people that's for the Jews. You're like the prophets in Jeremiah's day who said, everything's going to be fine, the king's not coming. And Jeremiah said, guys, the king's coming, and we're going, into, we're going to get killed. Either go to captivity or get killed. And they refused to listen to the common sense teaching of Jeremiah, and most of them got killed. So I'm just telling you that those passages, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, are clearly for the disciples, for us. We will be here for the tribulation time. We are not here when the wrath of God falls on the world. Don't confuse tribulation and wrath. They're not the same. Don't confuse Day of Christ, mentioned at least seven times, maybe even twelve times alluded to. Don't confuse the Day of Christ, which is the rapture. Don't confuse that with the Day of the Lord, which is a thousand year period mentioned hundreds of times throughout the Bible. We'll get into that when my brother straightens up. But he's a hunchback, so it <clears throat> might be a while. That's a joke, Hannah. I know you got blonde hair. I'll explain it to you later. Okay. Um, just kidding. Relax. So this thousand year period is also broken up into two parts. It has a time of wrath when God pours out his wrath on planet earth. And then it has a time of great blessing. And since it's only a sixteenth of an inch long here compared to the thousand year kingdom, I had to greatly shorten this to fit here. If I kept this the same scale as this back here, this part from hither to yon would have to be 416 feet long. I don't want to carry a chart that big. So I shortened it. So this means there's a whole bunch taken out, like 415 feet probably gone out of this section right here. Okay, so 5A of the book talks about the ceiling of the 144,000 Jewish witnesses. These two witnesses are going to be testifying for the Lord in Jerusalem, probably Enoch and Elijah, just a guess. 
an educated guess, but since they never died, that's and it's appointed unto man wants to die, they're probably going to be the ones. Then somewhere in the middle of this time of wrath, these two are killed, and for three and a half days it says the whole world views their bodies. Well, that wasn't possible when that prophecy was written. How can the whole world view two dead people? Well, today with Internet, TV, no problem. Push a button and the whole world can see them. They're going to watch them for three and a half days and send gifts to each other. They're going to make a holiday out of the day these two guys died because they're going to be a pain in the posterior of the whole world. They're not going to like them. But the young Jewish men are going to be watching and listening to these guys. And when they see the Messiah come use the trumpet and hear the trumpet and call us up, they're going to get converted, 144,000 of them, all except for the tribe of Dan and Ephraim. Another long story. We cover that in the book if you want to get the book of why those two tribes are not uh, represented by the 144,000, but 12,000 from the other tribes. They're going to s listen to these witnesses. They're going to get converted for another, we don't know how long, a year or so. These two witnesses are going to be training and teaching these guys, and then they are killed and then caught up to heaven also while everybody's watching. It says everybody's watching when they stand upon their feet and take off back for heaven. God, even during his time of wrath, which is about three years, 1,040 days, even during his time of wrath, God is trying to get people saved. He's not willing that any should perish. So he wants people saved. That's the bottom line. This stupid idea that only a few can be saved. And the Calvin is teaching that God has already determined who's going. And if you're not in those predetermined bunch, it's too late, too bad for you. That is just pure heresy. Uh, anybody can be saved. For God so loved the world. It's not God so loved the elect. And there are churches all over teaching that idea that only a few are elected to be saved. And you tell them, Kent said, I completely disagree. They're wrong. Anybody can be saved. Not everybody will be, and maybe it's going to be your fault or my fault because we didn't tell them. Somebody runs over a cliff because nobody told them, hey, the, the bridge is out or there's a corner here. Well, then it might be, it's their fault for running over the cliff, but it might be partly my fault for not stopping them or telling them. And so same thing has happened with people, people going to hell when they have not ever been told. If your neighbor dies and goes to hell, it's his fault. He's a sinner. He's going to hell. I understand. But it might be your fault partly because you could have and should have told them. That's the responsibility of the soul winner. That's why I want to try to witness to everybody I can. If they don't like it, oh well. At least I told them. <laughs> I'm trying. And you should do the same thing. Our job is not to make them listen or even love them. We don't have to love them. The Bible says God so loved the world doesn't say can't so love the world. I can hate him and still share the message with him. Jonah hated the people he was talking to. Hated him. He said, I'm, you guys are all going to hell. I hope you do. Ha, ha, ha. And they repented and God forgave them. And Jonah got mad about it. So you don't have to love people. You don't have to care about them at all. You just have to share the message. You're the ambassador. Get busy. Do something. To go tell your neighbor God loves them. And you don't have to love them. Tell them God loves them. You can tell the person who's done evil things to you, hey, God loves you and you better get saved or you're going to hell. And secretly, wait on deep, I hope you do. I mean, if people want to throw that in, I wouldn't. But during this time of wrath, which is not tribulation, tribulation is what the world does to us. Wrath is what God does to the world. During this time of wrath, God still wants people saved. He's trying to get their attention. There are about 180 references in the Bible where it uses the phrase, may know. That Israel may know, that Egypt may know, that Pharaoh may know, that Babylon may know. God wants people to know. He wants everybody to be saved, and he does things to try to get their attention. And some people just simply don't listen. The Jews, all through their last 2,000 years especially, have simply not listened. Jesus is the Messiah. And when they finally look on him whom they pierced, they're going to say, uh-oh, uh-oh. He was the one, wasn't he? Yeah, he was it. You messed up, fellas. But that doesn't mean you can't still be saved. Forget what Grandma says. You can still be saved and go to heaven. Grandma, Grandpa, Great Grandpa doesn't like Jesus Christ. Well, you let them handle their part. You're going to stand before God for you. And I'm going to stand for me. It doesn't matter what anybody else does or says. So this time of great wrath consists of quite a few things. We mentioned in the book of Revelation there are three categories of events that happen. There are seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven vials. We are raptured out when the sun and the moon go dark at the sixth seal, Revelation chapter 6, verse 12. Everything after that talks about the wrath of God, not the tribulation. 
And that's the time when God pours out his wrath on the world in the form of seven trumpet judgments and seven vile judgments. So in my book, uh, Appendix 5A, talks about the sealing of the 144,000 Jews. That's the first thing that happens. They are sealed. They are protected. And we see that they show up later as all still alive at the end of this tribulation period, at the end of this time of wrath, I'm sorry. 144,000 are still alive, Revelation chapter 14. But until this time, the Bible says blindness has happened to Israel. Israel is just blinded. They don't want to see this stuff. You can read about the blindness in Romans 11:25, or 2 Corinthians 3:14 through 16, or quite a few other places. But or, or in the book, what on earth is about to happen? Hopefully, going to be done here real soon, off to the press, and who knows how long it'll take—four, five, six weeks, we think—and you'll be able to get uh, the the very one, of the very very few copies available in, in in hardback. And the big question is, who cares? Well, somebody might. They might want to help the ministry get started and donate some money. So that's up to you. We don't. I have a real hard time uh, asking for people to help. I'd rather just go do it myself. I'm just going to go. I don't tell people what I need. And sometimes you have to, though. I think people want to help. So okay, if you want to help, uh, get a hold of Theodore. You can get put on the list uh, of those waiting for a copy. If you want to donate, that'll go to Ernie Land uh, and made out to Creation Science Evangelism (CSE Incorporated). Ernie's doing all that. Uh, he's in. Uh, uh, Westville, Florida, uh, 1798 West, no, Melson, M-E-L-S-O-N, Westville, Florida, 32464. Uh, you can send anything to Ernie. If it's a donation to get the ministry going, he's the trustee and to take care of all that, the banking. I don't handle the money. Uh, and I just get a regular paycheck, $10 a week, a uh, month or a year, something like that. Uh, I just want to win souls too, but Ernie can handle it. Or you can email him at docfog, D-O-C-F-O-G, at docfog.com. And you can, uh, if you want to donate, but if you want to get on the list, tell uh, Theodore or Ernie, either one, I think. They'll be back with each other. Say, I would like one of the hardback copies uh, when they come out. I'd like to donate $500 to get the ministry going. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, it, Revelation chapter 7 starts off, after we're gone, we're taken out at Revelation chapter 6, when the sun and the moon go dark, we take off for heaven. We've seen that before. Then we start a time of God's wrath poured out on earth. But the first thing he does, he seals these 144,000 Jews, seals them in their forehead somehow, where the, nothing will hurt them. And they survive through the entire time. They are the evangelists, the soul winners. All young, all men, all Jews, all virgins, it says 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. And it mentions all the details. It's not the Jehovah's Witnesses. That's all covered in uh, Revelation chapter 7. And he said, don't hurt the earth or the grass or the trees until we've sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. Look, if you are a child of God and you're trying to do what God wants you to do, you have nothing to fear. Romans 8.28, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. I just spent the last nearly nine years in federal prison over one of the dumbest laws ever passed in the history of humanity, st structuring. They should repeal that and make it retroactive and pay me back everything they took and, uh, in spades. But they may not. I don't know. That's, that's got... The real trial hasn't even happened yet. I mean, that comes Judgment Day. The real trial comes up here, the Great White Throne Judgment. That's when we're going to see some really amazing things. Like, he did what? <laughs> when it's all going to be exposed, no more whitewashing, no more shooting people and laying them out in the field. And Like Vince Foster, who's left-handed, and he finds the gun in his right hand. And that's another long story. Anyway, uh, you have nothing to fear. Romans 8:28. God will take care of his own. You just say, Lord, I'm your child. I'm going to do what you tell me to do. All through the Bible, the prophets of God were told what to do by God, and if they did it, God protected them, or sometimes God let them get killed. Micaiah apparently got killed. He did exactly what God told him to do and got killed. Some of the prophets were killed. Isaiah, according to tradition, was put in a hollow log and sawed in half. Read Hebrews chapter 11. We don't know. See, what's going to happen for sure in this world? This world is not my home, my favorite song. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. We're not going to, this is just all temporary. Relax, calm down. It's not going to matter in a million years. It won't matter. So, uh, Dan and Ephraim, two of the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 sons of Jacob, way back here in uh, 2000 B.C., Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, 
Jacob got married, had four wives and 13 children, one daughter and 12 sons. Of those 12 sons, of, uh, they're called, his name was changed from Jacob to Israel, same guy. So the 12 tribes of Israel, two of them, Dan and Ephraim, are not mentioned in the Revelation passage. They, their tribe really messed up uh, many times. And Hosea 4 said, uh, Ephraim is joined to his idols. Let him alone. He went off into idolatry, and he doesn't get part of the inheritance. But you can read all, of that, all about that in the book here. So God's going to seal the servants of God in their forehead, and they're going to be protected through this entire time of God's wrath, which we have as Appendix 5B in my book. One moron said, oh, Hoban's book is only six pages long. Yeah, well, I said that, and it clearly is, that I summarize everything in six pages, and everything else in the book is addendum to those pages. That is correct. I say, here's, what, here's the big picture, and I say the whole thing in six pages, and then everything else is Appendix 1, Appendix 2, 3, 4, 5. Ah, you can't help some people. I hope stupidity is not contagious, because I've been right next to it sometimes. I would have caught it by now. If they, anyway, uh, so then in Zechariah chapter 12 says the Jews are going to look on him whom they pierced. They pierced Jesus. They nailed him to the cross. And they're going to look on him and get converted. Some will. So that's coming soon. Uh, I also want to cover, uh, so at the end of this about three-year period, this 1,040 days, Jesus comes back. The return of Christ. There's actually two parts to the second coming of Christ. He comes the first time down only as far as the clouds, catches us up while we're up at the marriage feast of the Lamb, having a wonderful time at the party for a thousand and forty days, almost three years. All hell's breaking out on earth during this time of God's wrath. Now the day of the Lord started right here. The day of the Lord started and it has two parts to it. It has a time of wrath and a time of blessing. And as you read all of the references in the in the prophets, Isaiah all the way to Malachi, you'll see probably nearly 200 times where it talks about this day of the Lord or that day. And it's strange. Sometimes it talks about what a great day of blessing it is and how wonderful things are. And other times it talks about, wow, God's angry and he's killing people and it's bad. Yeah, it, the day of the Lord has two aspects to it. it. Starts off with a time of wrath when he cleans house. Jesus did the same thing. First time he went into Jerusalem to the temple, he cleaned the temple out. He went in there and threw out the money changers. And then three years later, when he went back into the temple, at the end of his ministry, he threw them out again. God's going to clean house. Then Jesus comes back down, this time all the way and touches down on the Mount of Olives. The first part, he comes only to the clouds, calls up the Christians. About three years later, comes all the way down, touches down on the Mount of Olives. It splits in half. Dead Sea fills in all the way up to the uh, Sea of Galilee, which is 600 feet below sea level. That whole valley fills in, probably overflows eventually if water keeps coming into it. It'll overflow either south down to Elat or north and uh, west over to uh, Mount Carmel out to the Mediterranean Sea. Maybe both. Maybe it'll make a new Suez Canal through there. So anyway, that time of God's wrath is covered in uh, the book Appendix 5B. It consists of seven trumpet judgments and seven vile judgments. Remember, you got STV, the seals, the trumpets, and the vials in Revelation. We're raptured out at the sixth seal. The first six are mentioned in Revelation chapter 6. talks about what happens when each seal is broken. When he opens the seventh seal, it introduces the seven trumpet judgments. And they are as follows. The first trumpet judgment, now this is taking place during the time of wrath. We're gone at the sixth seal. But during the time of God's wrath, the first trumpet causes a third of all the trees and grass to be burned up. What would cause that? Well, maybe there's a natural explanation for this. Maybe there's just plain supernatural. But I think one natural explanation is, for the last 20 years, a bunch of morons worried about global warming have been spraying the sky. They're called chemtrails. Just Google chemtrails or go to realityzone.com and look at that video. What in the world are they spraying? They're spraying the clouds, or making clouds, they say, to reflect sunlight and prevent global warming so Al Gore doesn't get a sunburn. Sunburn. Oh, what a moron. Anyway, um, the truth is, what the things that they're spraying will reflect sunlight for a couple hours, and then they fall down to the earth, and for the next 300 years, it causes trouble on earth. So they, <laughs> they're spending a fortune. They're causing a thousand times more environmental damage by mining this stuff. Let's say it's aluminum oxide or bauxite. They're mining this stuff, refining it, loading it in the plane, flying around spraying it, 
and then landing the plane. I mean, the, the environmental damage just of that is thousands of times greater than any possible benefit of spraying it in the cloud, spraying it to make a cloud and reflect the sunlight. But when that stuff finally settles down, it gets soaked into the plants. And you ask any forest fire fighter who goes out there and fights the fires, and he'll say, man, things burn hotter than ever. The last 20 years, forest fires have been incredible, and they're, they're, they're much worse. They're burning. Well, all the plants are full of these metals. Now, metals don't burn very well until they get to really high temperatures. But anybody that's ever uh, had their car catch fire and had mag wheels on it, once that magnesium gets going, it's all over. That's what they make fireworks out of, ground up, fine powdered magnesium. Shoot it up in the sky and poof, makes the sparks. What's burning? That's metals burning. And wait till the trees catch fire. A third of all the trees are going to be burned up, according to Revelation. That's the first of the trumpet judgments. Now, it's interesting. They're spraying with this stupid global warming thing and this chemtrail stuff about a third of planet Earth. That's the amount being sprayed. So I just may think maybe there might be a tie in there. We'll see. Second trumpet judgment, a third of the sea becomes blood, a third of the creatures die in the sea, and a third of the ships are destroyed. When the fourth trumpet sounds, a third of the rivers and fountains of water become wormwood, and many people die from that. When the fourth trumpet sounds, a third of the sun and the moon are darkened. I can't explain that at all. The fifth trumpet sounds, the bottomless pit is open, smoke and locusts come out, and the locusts torment men for five months. Now, after the fifth trumpet judgment, these two witnesses are killed. So that's why I arbitrarily placed this ending right in here in the middle of this time of wrath. These two guys, whoever they are, are going to be preaching and witnessing. The 144,000 unconverted Jews are going to be listening and watching. And all of a sudden, when Jesus, when they look on him whom they pierced, they're going to realize, wow, these two guys were right. That was the Messiah. We missed him. They will get converted too late for the rapture. They will continue to be trained by these guys for maybe a year and a half or so, just a pure guess on my part. And then these two guys are killed and taken off to heaven, but the 144,000 keep doing their job. God never leaves the world without a witness. And if it ends up killing you for your testimony, God will give you great rewards. When he sends a messenger, if you end up getting hurt, you got great retirement benefits. So all through history, God's messengers... Just God says, you just deliver my message. If they kill you, I'll give you great rewards. There are special rewards to those who allow the world to harm them or kill them for the cause of Christ. So don't worry about it. God's got plenty. Actually, Revelation 20 says, those that were beheaded for the witness of Christ, they get to rule and reign for a thousand years. They certainly get the bonus prize of that thousand years on earth. I'm not sure who else gets that, but certainly the martyrs do. They might be the only ones. We shall see. If you're faithful unto death, God will say, okay, you get to be president of the United States or Canada or Alabama or something. I don't know. Probably depending on to whom much is given, of him shall much be required. Maybe if you're faithful over little things, he'll make you ruler over much. Maybe it'll be ten cities or five cities or two cities. That's, uh, that's up to God. But just do what God tells you to do. It doesn't matter what the world thinks. So after the fifth trumpet, these guys are uh, raptured out of here. And the whole world gets to see it. The fact that the whole world gets to see it, it's interesting. There has to be internet or television, which wasn't invented when that prophecy was made 2,000 years ago. How could they possibly say the whole world is going to see one event going on in Jerusalem? For years, people thought, that's foolish, that's crazy, that's not possible. That's correct. It wasn't possible when it was said. Today, it is possible, and it's going to happen. All of it's going to happen. Every bit is going to happen. You say, I don't believe it. Well, just sit back and watch. It will happen. When he sounds the sixth trumpet, a third of all the men are killed. Now, I have tried and tried to be a mathematician. said, okay, how can we figure this out? A third are killed here. A third are killed. Is that a third of the two-thirds that are left? Probably. You figure it all up, and I found out I can't figure it all up. I don't know. But during this time of God's wrath, a whole lot of people are killed. So let's just arbitrarily, wildly pick some numbers. Let's say there are seven billion people on earth today. Roughly 7 billion, and they're making more here. So after this time of the seven weeks of uh, tribulation, the seven years, actually only the three and a half is called tribulation. But after that, we enter this time of wrath when a whole bunch of people are killed. Uh, some of them say a third here and a third there. Let's just guess that 2 billion people survive through the time of tribulation. 
I'm just picking a number. I don't know. We start with 7 billion. A lot of Christians are killed here. At least 100,000. 10,000 times 10,000. I'm sorry, 100 million are killed, which is only a tenth of a billion in the big picture. But then a bunch of people are killed during this time of God's wrath with these trumpet judgments and vile judgments. Let's just pretend and pick a number and say, okay, at the end of all this, there are still 2 billion normal, everyday humans still alive. Many not converted, not Christian. Then the Lord comes back, we have the Battle of Armageddon, and we, these people keep right on living. So during this millennial time, this thousand-year kingdom, there's actually two kinds of people on earth. There's the mortals, who lived through this time of wrath, and the immortals, who came back to rule and reign with Christ. The, the 10 million, 100 million, who had, were beheaded for the witness. They cannot die again. Now, it appears from the Isaiah passage that a child shall die at 100 years of age. Maybe things are going to be restored during this thousand years, like they were back here before the flood came, when people lived to be 900, and that was just normal. You lived to be 900. I think that's the case. I couldn't prove it dogmatically, but I suspect that's what's going to happen. We're going to see conditions restored like they used to be before the flood came and wrecked everything. But these you got the uh, trumpet judgments, and then the vile judgment. A vile is simply a bowl. He's going to pour out a bowl of his wrath. When he pours out the first vial, there's a noisome and grievous sore falls on all men that with the mark of the beast. Only those with the mark of the beast get it. Now, it could be, and this is, again, a guess on my part, that this mark of the beast is going to be a microchip invented 20-some years ago, this little tiny chip that they're going to put in the, under the skin. It says it goes in the forehead or in the hand, uh, not on, like the New King James and all the other perversions say. So this little microchip, I understand, has some of them can have a little lithium battery, and that is recharged by temperature change. Uh, Carl Sanders, not Colonel Sanders, but Carl Sanders from Mountain View or Mountain Home, Arkansas, I forget. Anyway, one of those, if he's still alive, he was pretty sick last time I saw him 10 years ago, but if he's alive, he, his company in Arkansas was one of those that helped develop this little chip about 25 years ago, whenever it was. The object was is to inject into pets. They put it in your pet's ear or something and they can you know, locate the pet. This is like your cat, you know. They can actually spot some of those with satellite and a lot of soldiers are being microchipped. So they can be coordinate the war from satellite. Okay, move this squad over there and move this team over there. So this little chip, if that breaks, if something happens where it's uh, the lithium especially gets out of its little glass case inside your body, it'll cause some real serious problems. I have heard it causes a huge boil, a noisome and grievous sore. We'll see how that works out. But when the first vial is poured out, people with the mark get a noisome and grievous sore. During the time of Egypt, before Moses let them out, 1400 B.C., uh, God separated during the time of plagues between Pharaoh and Egypt. Some things happened to Pharaoh, like the darkness, and right next door they had light over in the land of Goshen. God's going to separate his people from those who receive the mark. Those with the mark are going to get a noisome and grievous sore when the first vial is poured out. The second vial is poured out, and the sea becomes as blood, and all thing living, things living in the sea die. That's going to upset the world economy considerably, make a royal mess. And the purpose of even God's wrath, he's angry, he's very angry, especially at what they just did to his children. God is angry, but even in wrath, he remembers mercy. He's willing to save. So if you're listening to this program and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, if you, we go through this time of 70th week of Daniel and the Christians get raptured out of here or killed, and then you say, wow, Hoban was right. Well, no, it's not hoping this right. It's the Bible this right. You can still give your heart to Jesus Christ and be saved. Now, you're probably going to get killed. I don't know. You should listen now is what you ought to do. <laughs> but if you won't listen now because you're hard-headed or bullheaded or dumb, well, listen later then. Give your heart to Jesus. It's never too late. As long as you're kicking, as long as you're alive, you can ask the Lord to forgive you and save you. So a lot of people are going to die during this time, and that'd be a good. And some people are going to see, wow, Lord, forgive me. Even in His wrath, He still wants people to know Him. He is not willing that any should perish. Second uh, Peter chapter three verse nine. He wants everybody to come to repentance. This Calvinist idea that only a few can be saved is wrong, stupid, wicked, and evil. Tell him I said so. Okay. When He pours out the third vial, the rivers and fountains become blood. And those that have shed the blood of the saints are given blood to drink. 
when he pours when he pours out the fourth vial, power is given to the sun to scorch men with fire and heat, possibly a nova or supernova. That would certainly do it. What if the temperature went from an average of 75 to an average of 135? I, I don't know. That would be, I would think, uncomfortable. Okay. And when he pours out the fifth vial, the wicked are given darkness, pain, and sores. When he pours out the sixth vial, the Euphrates River is dried up to make way for the kings of the east. The most commonly accepted theory on this is, and I believe it is true, China is the only place with an army of 200 million. 200 million in their army. America's only got 300 million people. They have 200 million in their army. And they've been building a highway, actually they're done, a highway through the Himalaya Mountains from China all the way over to, to Israel. The, uh, they, you can drive there now is what I understand. The Euphrates River is in the way, but there have already several dams now up in Turkey where they can close the dam and save all the water and completely dry up the Euphrates River. The Euphrates is dried up for, maybe there's a natural explanation for this with the dams and the highway. Maybe there's a supernatural explanation. I don't know. But it's going to happen uh, the, when the sixth vial is poured out. When the seventh vial is poured out, there's a time of voices, thunders, lightnings, and a great earthquake. And the great city is divided. Great Babylon is brought into remembrance. And a great hailstone takes a hailstorm takes place with each stone weighing a talent. I understand that's 75 pounds. A 75-pound hailstone would be about 12-inch diameter, like a globe. If one of those hits your car, it's going to put a dent in it. If it hits your head, it's going to knock some sense into you and say, Wow, I really ought to be paying attention. God, you're, try you're trying to get my attention. And how they can, some men can still curse God after getting hit by a 75-pound rock, uh, ice, ice rock. It, that's, a, that's, that's amazing. Anyway, this time of wrath is not only called the time of wrath, it's called a time of judgment. And I'll just rattle off some of these verses. You can look it up for yourself. Read Revelation 14, Revelation 15, 16, and 19. talks about this time being the time of God's judgment being poured out. This is called the time of indignation in Isaiah 26 and Isaiah 34. It's called the time of punishment in Isaiah chapter 2 and chapter 24. This is called the time of destruction in Joel chapter 1. It's called the time of darkness in Joel chapter 2 and Zephaniah chapter 1 and Amos chapter 5. And all this is in my book. Uh, it's called a, an hour of temptation in Revelation chapter 3. It's called a great and terrible day in Joel chapter 2. There are hundreds of verses that deal with this time of God's wrath. When you read about the day of the Lord, all through, especially the Old Testament, sometimes it talks about it as a time of wrath, and other times it's a time of great blessing. That is correct. There are two parts to this time, to this day of the Lord. The wrath being poured out for about three years, and then a wonderful time of blessing, peace on earth, goodwill toward men for the thousand years, what's left over of a thousand years, 997.2 whatever years of peace on earth and goodwill toward men. But there are, I have a list of maybe 20 verses of, of the hundreds that talk about this time being a time of wrath, the day of the Lord, a time of vengeance and wrath. And in the next half of some of those verses, it talks about what is going to be wonderful. The lion and the lamb lay down together. People say, well, what? Is this a contradiction? No, it's talking about two parts to the same day, the day of the Lord. Okay, so while this is taking place down on earth, we that are saved are raptured up, and we are at the marriage supper of the Lamb. There are two different comings of the Lord. We'll talk about that in the next broadcast. The first coming, he only comes to the clouds. Second coming, all the way to the earth, and the Mount of Olives splits in half, and we have the Battle of Armageddon. Cover that next time. Thank you so much.